we just share like different things. Sometimes we share like, okay, what is God stirring in our heart for this coming year? You know, what do we feel like God's doing for this coming year? And then sometimes we just share something we've learned throughout the last year. Um, So we weren't able to do that this year because they were out of town and stuff. And so I was just thinking about that over the last couple of days. Um, And just thinking about the last year, you know, and what it would mean to me and what it has been to me. And this last year, excuse me, goodness, has been actually really a challenging year for me personally. And just in different ways, there's been a lot of challenges, a lot of change in life and um, just different, you know, things that you think, oh, I'm totally over this. I've overcome this. And then all of a sudden it's like creeping back in and you're like, I thought I had overcome this. And so there's, there's just been a lot of different obstacles and challenges. Thank you. A lot of different obstacles and challenges this past year. And and I felt like I failed a lot in many ways. You know, that feeling of like, oh, like I could have done it better. I could have handled this better. I could have responded better. Um, and I have in a lot of ways. But I was just thinking if I could think about what this past year has been to me, it's been a reminder of his goodness. Like those last two songs were just shaking me up because in the midst of all the change, in the midst of all the feeling of failure, the struggles like um, with old old battles, you know, coming up in, in my life, the one thing that's remained the same is him. You know, he's been constant and and good and it and it's not he's not good because everything's been good (laughs) he's not good because there hasn't been a challenge he's not good because he's come through for me in the way that I would have preferred him to come through because honestly he didn't come through in the way I wanted at all this past year (laughs) he did it his own way but but he came through and he and he was constant he was always there he was always showing me who he was not what he can, what I can get out of him, you know, but who he is, which changes things. So anyway, if I were to talk about what this last year has been to me, it's been a revelation of his goodness and his love. So with that being said, I wanted to share what's been weighing on my heart about communion for quite some time. And Uh, that is just that I think, to say it frankly, many times we totally just go through the motions with communion. I mean, it's something that if you've been in church throughout your life, it's easy to do, you know? It's easy to just, it's your routine, you know? And, And we don't really, really think about what, what it means. And so, I wanted to start off by reading our typical communion verses, which is 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 26. And this says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So we know that communion is remembering Jesus' blood and remembering his body. And we take communion to remember it. But what are we remembering? You know, what are we remembering? I mean, it's easy to say, yeah, I'm remembering Jesus because he died on the cross for my sins and I have eternal life. That is huge. But yet, that is just an inkling of the peace of what he gave with his body and his blood. And so I just wanted to 
share a few things that he gave. So Jesus' blood, the things that it does, and and I'm not going to read every single scripture because I'm supposed to do communion, not the sermon, although Rod did give me unlimited time. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> this could be a whole message, so I'm... <laughs> so I'm just going to try to keep it condensed. But with his blood, he redeems us. And my favorite redemption story in the Bible is Ruth, the story of Ruth. Because we think about what communion is and what he did, but we don't really think about it. I mean, and maybe it's just me, but it's like, do we really think about how did he redeem me let me look at my life. Let me look at, at the good times, the bad times, the terrible times. How did he redeem me? How is he my redeemer? And that story is just beautiful because it's a story of complete and utter hopelessness. It's a story of there is no way. It's impossible. You're alone the rest of your life. All you can do is go back to where you came from the bondage and the hopelessness that you were in. And the Redeemer comes. I mean, Boaz is supposed to be an example of Jesus, the Redeemer. So he redeems us. His blood redeems us. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. He reconciles us to God. That's another thing his blood does. He reconciles us. And that makes me think of an estranged relationship. And maybe you have an estranged relationship in your life, you know, where it's like a father and a son haven't talked their entire life, you know, and they're, they're separated. And Jesus reconciles us back to the Father. He brings us back in relationship with him. Romans 3.25 says, For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So he's made us right with God, and we're able to be in relationship with him. Okay? Like, if we think about that for a minute, (laughs) anytime we want, we can talk to God. Anytime. That was not how it was before. We can draw boldly to the throne room of grace. Like, that's a, a huge, huge deal. This, another thing his blood did is he paid our ransom. And I just, we were kidnapped by sin. You know, I just was thinking about some movie that my husband and I had watched, and it was where this man's daughter got kidnapped. And it, he just went to every extent possible to get her back, you know? And, and that's what Jesus did. He paid our ransom. He did whatever it took to get us back, to save us. And 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19 says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver, It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. His blood washed away our sins. And the thing I love about this is it's ongoing. His blood washes away our sins. He cleans our filth forever and ever and ever. And... I think that that's something that sometimes as believers we just take for granted, you know. It says, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's First John 1, 7. Another thing Jesus' blood did and does is forgives us, you know, and And so these are all things that are so different, but yet we try to clump them all together as one thing. But it's not. It's not one thing. It's so much more than that. Because washing away our sin and making us clean is not the same as forgiving us. Forgiving us is because he doesn't hold it against us. Not only does he wash it away, he clears our record. Like if we were a convicted felon, he wipes that away. We're no longer a convicted felon. But then he doesn't hold it against us. He doesn't say, well, you did all this junk over here, so 
I don't think I'm going to bless you and your job. He forgives. The Bible says that he remembers our sins no more. He doesn't forget because God can't forget. He's a genius. He chooses not to remember our sins. He forgives us. Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> Another thing his blood does is it frees us. Freedom. It's the opposite of bondage. Like that song we sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. The freedom. And that, you know, when I'm trying to just let that sink in, I just think about, like, every freedom that I have. And I try to think about, what if I didn't have it? What would my life be like? And and I'm in physical things, yes, but I'm not even just talking physical. I'm talking about when you've done something wrong or when you've messed up or when you've fallen short and the enemy comes in and wants to tell you how worthless you are and how you'll never be enough and or whatever, you know, like, you're never going to get over this. You're always going to be like this, you know. The freedom because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The freedom of being able to know, nope, you're right, I never can, but somebody already did. And that's the freedom he gives us. Revelations 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He justifies us. The blood justifies us. That proves us to be right. He's like our attorney who won the case. You know, he goes in, and we're standing there defeated and, you know, facing charges that we deserve. And he comes in and takes it upon himself, and then he justifies us. He makes us right. He cleanses our guilty conscience. This one's a big one for me. I know everybody has, you know, deals with things differently, but, um, but I like to obey the rules. <laughs> I'm a rule follower. I've always been like that. But I'm a perfectionist, and so the conscious, the guilty conscious, is something that you know the enemy really tries to use against us. And we all have that. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, obviously, we know that means eternal hell. Like, if we're not saved and we haven't received Jesus, the wages of sin is death, you know. But it's also death emotionally, mentally, relationally, spiritually, you know. And he cleanses, his blood cleanses our guilty conscience. It lifts the guilt and the shame because guilt and shame are heavy. <clears throat> He sanctifies us. The blood sanctifies us, which means we're set apart. He declares us as holy. It's like he picked us to be on his team. You know, I think about times when, when you're a kid, and, and maybe you never struggled with this, but where, you know, they have one kid that starts picking and another kid from a group, you know, and you're like, don't let me be the last one. Please don't let me be the last one that nobody wants, you know. It's like when he chose us and sanctified us and picked us, he picked us to be on his team. He said, you're mine. And he set us apart as his children, as his own. And Hebrews thirteen twelve says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. He, the blood opened the way to the presence of God. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now you have been united with Christ Jesus once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. And the way that I th thought about this, and maybe it seems silly, but I just try to put it in the here and now, because so many times his word, we can, it can seem so far off to us. Communion, Jesus' blood and what it did can seem so far off to us, but he, his blood opened the way to the presence of God. He gave me his cell number. <laughs> you know, he gave me his cell for the teenagers that aren't here today. He <laughs> gave me his Snapchat. He gave us his garage code. I think about growing up after I moved out of my parents' house, like, I, I still had the garage code. 
so I could come over whenever I wanted and rummage through the pantry and <laughs> take what I wanted, you know. He did that for us. That's what Jesus' blood did for us. He, he gave us direct connection with him. Anytime. He gives us peace. For God and all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And like Jesus said in John 14, it's not the world's kind of peace. The world's kind of peace is conditional, always. And boy, do I search after that sometimes. I'll be good if I get this. I'll have peace if I've got a stash in my bank account. You know, I'll have peace if my husband doesn't talk to me when I first wake up in the morning. (laughs) I'm not a morning person. I'm like, don't talk to me. But that's not the kind of peace Jesus gives. It's unconditional. It's, It's a different kind of peace. His blood, this is the last one, this blood, overcomes the enemy. Revelations 12, 11, and I love this verse so much. And they overcame him, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. His blood overcame the enemy. It's already been done. So when the enemy's trying to come against us in our life, we've overcome by the blood of the lamb. And the word of our testimony. So he's given us victory in every battle. He's given us victory in every war. It's already been finished. And we just get to stand in that victory. So those are the things, some of the things his blood has done for us. So when we take communion and we're remembering his blood, it's like we should strive to remember the vastness and the greatness of what he did. And how does it look in our own lives? And I think that's something that we can take home and ponder on. Like, what does this look like in my life? You know, how does this look for me? There's been times where I've written it out. Like, you saved me from this. I was going this way. And what if, what if you let me go that way? Like that song says, he leaves, leaves the 99 to chase after you. What if you didn't chase after me? And you just let me go that way. And I kept going, what would that look like? What could have happened? You know? And not that we need to ponder on terrible things, but it's like to be able to recognize what he saved us from, sometimes we have to think about where we may have headed without him. So the body, it won't be as long, I promise. We also are remembering his body. And so many times I feel like there's a lot of emphasis on his blood. You know, we sing about the blood of Jesus, like we talk about the blood of Jesus, we talk about the forgiveness of our sins, you know, and there's not a lot of talk about his body, you know. So it's like, why the body? Why are we remembering the body? Well, we know, all all of us here, I believe, know that Jesus came to earth in a fleshly human body. But that's important because... Other gods and other religions didn't do that. He came in a fleshly body. And so he understands living as a human. He understands living as we did. And I have a ton of scriptures that talk about that. But um, I'm just going to read a couple. It's, uh, John 1, 1 through 3 says, Jesus was God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. But he became flesh and dwelt among us, so he was God in the flesh. Hebrews 2.14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. So Jesus' body is so important. It's so important because without it, there would have been no death and resurrection. There would have been no death and resurrection. There's other things that his body did. He, he came in human form so he could teach his disciples as a man, as a friend. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of The Chosen. I'm representing The Chosen Day with my hoodie. But it, I feel like, is a great depiction of Jesus' relationships with the disciples, you know, as a man. He came so he could live as an example to show us how to live. So we can't ever cry out to God and say, you don't understand 
you don't understand. You don't know what it's like to be rejected. Yeah, he does. Because he came. He chose to be human so that he could understand. He came so that he, be- he could become the king of his spiritual kingdom and the head of his church. He came so he could demonstrate that he understands our problems and can sympathize with us as our high priest because he has experienced living as a man. He's experienced every problem we could ever experience. And I think that's something else we overlook when we read about Jesus. We don't think about what he suffered before the cross, just as a man. Um, So the primary reason that Jesus needed to come to earth as a man so that he could die as a sacrifice for our sins. He gave up everything. He gave up everything to be born a human. And he humbled himself. Philippians 2, 7 through 8 says, Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus existed from eternity as God, but as God, he could not die. So he came in the flesh, so that as a man he could die for our sins. The body of Jesus is so important because we would never have that. We would never have. He would have never been able to die for our sins. We've been sanctified through off, through the offering of his body. Jesus said that his body was broken for us. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. So the Father gave a body to Jesus so Jesus could give the body as a sacrifice for us. He received the body so he could give it for others. And that's our ultimate example. That's why we remember the body. And the last thing we get to take from his body is that he gave us a body. So as we remember his body, we remember that he gave us a body. And he wants us to honor him with our body Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So we remember his blood and we remember his body today. And those are huge, weighty things, but they're things that are to be happy about. (laughs) I mean, I know I've been emotional, but it's not a sad thing. It's it's an incredible thing, which is why we remember it, you know, so we can celebrate. So, so I want to read um, Matthew 26 through 30. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, "This, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. So another thing that I caught at the very end of that as we get ready to take communion is that another thing we get to remember when we're taking communion is that we will get to do this with him. That he's coming back because he says, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So it's a reminder that we get to spend eternity with him and that we're going to be celebrating with him. If you want to get your cup, I'm going to pray. Lord God, we just thank you so much for your blood. We thank you so much for the joy that we have in being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, being reconciled to you, our sins being washed away, being forgiven, having 24-7 access to your presence, Lord. So, Lord God, today as we take this communion, I pray that we would remember what your blood has been to each of us in our own lives. And we just thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. 
Lord God, we also thank you for your body. We thank you for the sacrifice you made, the choice you made to come to earth as a human, to give away and to give up all your luxuries, to come to be like us, Lord, so that you could understand, so that you had a body, so that you could make that ultimate sacrifice by giving your life once and for all, for all mankind, Lord. So we just thank you and praise you, and we are so grateful today for your body, Lord. And I just pray that as we take this bread, Lord God, that we would remember that you gave us a body as well, Lord, and that we would use it. We would use our life to show your love to those around us. We praise you for your body, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I really felt like I was supposed to do this, even though I didn't really want to. (laughs) Um, At the end of that scripture, it talked about how when they finished taking communion, it says, then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. And I just felt like we were supposed to sing a hymn. And not the whole thing, (laughs) but... I'm sure most of you are familiar with nothing but the blood of Jesus. So I just want to sing that, Um, you know, thanking him and praising him for this today, what we're remembering, his body and his blood. So if you know this and would sing with me, I would love that because I want us all to just thank him. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus nothing but the blood of jesus thank you jesus for your blood amen amen all right i can already hear some of the uh stomachs growling out there so this is going to be uh short actually i uh was planning on doing something and i'll you know i'm on uh been asking the lord a lot about 2023 you know what what 2023 holds and um i never get anything for myself it's usually just something kind of a big picture of things more on a national or or world uh, area um and so but i'm gonna wait now uh because i'll I'll share that next week nathan's gonna be sharing and then so it'll be two weeks, I'll kind of be sharing with you guys about that. 
but in the meantime, while, while uh, Brittany was talking, I also thought about something else, just thinking of the difference that the cross made and, and how we celebrate uh, the blood that was shed on our behalf and the broken body. I was also thinking at that time about, you know, if you go in the Old Testament, everyone went to Sheol or to Hades. That was, no one ever came out, okay? The only two people who didn't experience that was Enoch and Elijah, and they were translated from this life straight to heaven. They never went to Sheol, so no one ever came out. But while Jesus, when he died, okay, he was three days. Well, those three days, he wasn't taking a nap. He was busy. It says in Revelations, he went and he took the keys of Hades and of Sheol that was the, that the Satan had had, and he freed that from there. And he went down and preached. He said, he, those, he who ascended also descended into the lower regions of the earth. And so he brought freedom to the captives. And so it's just another example of, of how privileged we are to live in the times that we live, that we have that. The other thing I just want to touch on briefly was, was um, this concept, really, of, of unity. That, um, you know, in John 17, which is the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, he says that, uh, that just as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, that he wants his body to be one. And if you think about it, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of denominations. We have division within churches. And Satan's, one of his primary tools is to bring division, to bring misunderstanding, to bring offense, to bring something that causes a wedge and breaks up the body of Christ. And yet that prayer of Jesus and John 17, will be fulfilled. Every prayer that Jesus prayed, we will see that. We will all come to one. And that whole chapter, really, the high priestly prayer is one just you need to be really familiar with. And then like in Ephesians chapter 4, we talk about the fivefold ministry. And it says we're going to have that fivefold ministry until we all come into unity, until we all come to the full measure of Christ. And obviously, we are a long ways from that right now. So those things are going to continue. Also, Ephesians 4, uh, 11 through 13 says, until we come into the unity and the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And Ephesians 4, 3 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So we're all going to have opportunities to either be offended, to miss, sometimes hear something, or someone misstate something. But we, we have to realize that that is the major tool of the enemy to come in and to, and to bring division. So just be aware. And like I say, I'll go to the 2023 things in two weeks. We'll talk about that because we're it's already 11.15. And <clears throat> again, I can hear the stomachs growling out there. Um, so, but we do want to take time for anybody who needs prayer. In fact, uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you need prayer. All right. So, let's have some people gather. Anybody else? All right. Let's get up out of the chairs and let's lay hands because we believe in healing. God to touch. And Steve needs some prayer too. Let's come over here and set, Steve. <clears throat> and while we're praying for these finished, I'm going to go ahead and pray over the uh, our chili supper. Okay? And then we can be dismissed and head over there. So, Lord, we just thank you again for this opportunity as we come together as your body, the body of Christ, Lord. Lord, just as they did the New Testament, they went house to house, they shared food together, 
They shared the table. They shared their lives together. And so, Lord, uh, as we go, Lord, we ask for your grace, your blessing upon the food for the nourishment of our bodies. We thank you for it. And, Lord, we pray for those. Uh, we have so many today who are out either traveling, and we have several others who have been hit by this flu bug. So we just ask for healing for them and a complete recovery, Lord. So we ask for your blessing and your grace. And we thank you again for this day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.